Okay, looks a bit odd, isn't it? So it's a linen cloth, and that was used to cover the body of our blessed Lord Jesus when he was taken down from the cross and put into the tomb. And we've always had great devotion to this. We've always known that this was the shroud that was used to cover Jesus when he went into the tomb. But this is all that we can see of it. See, it's not very a bit hard to make out, isn't it? You can kind of see that there's a head here, maybe there's some arms, maybe some hands there, you can kind of see some legs. So that's all that we can see on the shroud. And that's all we can do. But it wasn't until uh, 1889 when the first photograph of the shroud was taken that we could actually discover something a little bit more beneath. But before I go into that, I'm actually going to have a replica here of the shroud which you read. So sometimes we can look at that and we just kind of think, oh, it's, it's a cloth. But it's actually quite big. And we know certain things from the shroud. And we know this because of the science that was done. So I think there's two volunteers who are going to come up uh, to help us with our, I think they've got, have you already been picked? Yes. Okay, so those who have been picked, please come forward. So obviously this is not linen, this is not cloth, this is a canvas, but it's an exact replica, so it's the same size of the shroud which linen actually is. So if we were to see it today, this is what it would look like. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and 
out in stone rolled away from the tomb door. So she came running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who was this disciple? John. They have carried the Lord away from the tomb, she said to them, and we cannot tell where they have taken him. Upon this, Peter and the other disciple both set out and made their way to the tomb. They began running side by side, but the other disciple outran Peter, who was obviously faster, and reached the tomb first. He looked in and saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came up after him and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there, and also the veil which had been put over Jesus' head, not laying with the linen cloths, but still wrapped around and around in the place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and saw this and believed. So here we have the first recorded um, record of the, the Shroud of Turin. So we see that the, the linen cloths are specific. So they're, they, all the disciples go into great, great, great detail in the Gospels, telling us about the linen. I mean, there's lots of other information that we probably would have loved to have heard, but they all focus on the fact that this linen cloth was there. And sometimes we can just bypass that and move on to the real story of the resurrection and then of our Lord appearing to the apostles and to Mary Magdalene and to all the other people. But we're here today and we're focusing on this linen cloth that was left there. As I said, the linen cloth was taken and it was moved from different places and it was ended up staying in Turin. So it was owned by the king of Italy and remained in his possession. Uh, right up until the 20th, 20th century, when it was then gifted to the Vatican. But the, and that's why it was called the Shroud of Turin. That's the only connection that it has to Turin. It's just that for most of its, of its life, it remained stayed in Turin and was looked after there. Then, in 1898, the royal family are having a baptism. And so they invite this photographer, Secunda Pia, to come and take photographs for the baptism. But why he is there? Because this is the beginning of photography. So photography's only been around for a lot of decades. So it's a very new invention. And so it's a great event to have someone in to take photographs, particularly on an event. But while he is there, they think it's a good opportunity to bring out one of their prized possessions, the Shroud of Turin. So they bring out the Shroud and he takes a photograph of it. And so this is the photograph that he takes. It is the first recorded photograph of the shroud. So it looks a bit odd, right? It's not, we can't really make it out. So up until this point, and in, in many cases, people did not believe this was really the shroud of Turin. They just thought maybe it was a fake. Somebody painted it, maybe in the, in the Middle Ages, maybe a bit before that, and that there was some, some way of uh, imprinting this image on the clock. And so we have this kind of vague image of a, of a face. And we kind of think, well, maybe it's, it's the blood that was, you know, when Jesus was put on, when it was put on top of him. We can see, yeah, it kind of looks a bit cartoonish, right? It kind of looks like some Bart Simpson or something with those big eyes. And it's very hard to make out any distinguishing features. But what Secundo Pia discovered was when he took the negative. So when we take a photograph, it's brought in, we have what's called a negative. So this is what happens when the negative is brought up. This is the miracle that we begin to now unfold. Because in the negative of, of the picture, we can see a lot more that's going on here. We can see, we can see where the eyes are, we can see the nose, we can see the beard, the lips, and of course, the hair. And so this is the difference which takes place. And this really begins the start of the investigation into the Shroud of Turin. How is this there? Because if it was just blood, these images would not come up on the cloth. There's something more that is taking place here. So this begins a great investigation. And the Shroud of Turin is a fact that it is the most investigated 
archaeological object in the world. More scientists and researchers have looked into this than any other archaeological object that is out there in the world. So it begins the interest of what really is this. There's something more to this. And it's only happening because science is becoming more and more powerful that we're now seeing a little bit more about what the shroud is. In 1931, photography is getting a little bit better. We have more cameras coming out, more powerful ones. And Giuseppe Enri is the one who's charged, and commissioned to take a photograph. Because before, the, the only, Segundo only took a picture of the head. And so we have the first images of the full length of the body. So we, here we have what we would see to the, to the eye, but this is then the negative version, so we can see even more greater detail. The outline of the body, the hues, you can see the wounds that are taking place here. So this was, it was put on public display, so it's very rarely that this is actually put on public display because it's such a special and delicate artifact that it's only every, I don't know, in the past 100 years, it's only been put on twice. So this was from the first time in 1931 where it was put on public display. So skip to then 1978 begins the biggest investigation that takes place. So this is the Air Force uh, Academy come forward in America, and they offer their services then for the uh, looking into and kind of doing scientific experiment on the terrain. What these scientists are going in there for, they're not going in to just kind of have a look at it, they want to make sure and to see, is it a fake? Because there's four ideas that are going around about this that it was painted on, uh, that it's some sort of a scorching, you know, some sort of a burning effect that was put on it, or some sort of a rubbing. You know, when you were in school, you know, in school where you like, have got a leaf, and you rub it on onto a page, you get a mark, you get a crayon on the top of it, or, or a pencil, or you know, you get a coin put on this paper, and you rub it, and you, and you see the image comes through the other side. So the thought, this was going to have to be one of these to see. And so the shroud is brought over uh, to America, and they, they were given 120 hours. So the Vatican allows them 120 hours to investigate this. So they put all the greatest technology that is used, and NASA is brought in as well to have given uh, the equipment and instruments to see what is taking place. So these are the images then that we see. Now what's peculiar about the images that the Academy take and what NASA take is that simply it couldn't have been a 2D thing. There's no way that it could have been 2D, that it could have been painted on. So they have they find no pigment, they find no uh, crayon or carbon or anything like that on the shroud. It's simply that there's a thin layer of um, what I will describe in a second. But we see that because of the advancement of science, that we see that there had to be a 3D body inside. So, and these are some of the images that have come out through that technology. Then we come, we come to this guy. So then it's in, in the early 2000s. Uh, this scientist here, uh, what is his name again? Anyways, tell me a second. So he investigates this to see how this image comes on this because of how thin the material that is on, which is giving us the imprint of the image. To give you an example, or for you maybe to imagine just how thin this image is placed on the cloth, on the linen cloth. If you take a piece, one piece of hair, if you cut that in half and discard one side, You've got the half. And you, if you keep making that half to a half, and you do that five times, then you will have the layer that is on the thing that gives us this, this imprint. So this scientist here in Italy and his, in, and his department want to see, can they recreate an image like that on another club? And they discover that they cannot. Because they say, 
that it would take 34,000 billion watts of energy to show, to recreate this on the clock. And that's what 34,000 billion looks like. And he says, this level of power cannot be produced by any DUV light source built to date. The most powerful available on the market today comes to several billion. So what does this tell us? This gives us something very important because how this image was put on there was through 34,000 billion watts of radiation, of energy, it's just in one flash that the image is imprinted on the clock. And it would have to take like a nanosecond, because if it was any more than that, it would have just burnt up the, the clock. And they tried this even with 7 billion uh, watts of, of power being put on onto a minute clock. It just scorched up, just went on fire, burnt up, just like that. So the precise moment, and I mean a nano, nano second, of a burst of the light, of energy, creating 34,000 billion watts of energy, <laughs> straight away onto the clock. This gives us an insight really of what the resurrection was. Some people say it just happened, that Christ just, you know, resurrected. But what we can tell from the shroud is that there was a sudden burst of light from the body and he passed through the cloth. And in doing so, leaves this image on the cloth for us to see today. The image is so thin that if you, you, could, if you were to rub a, a razor blade on top of it, you would remove the image forever. That's how delicate this is. But that gives us an insight of what happened on Easter Sunday when the resurrection took place. That it had to have been this enormous burst of light which took place in the shroud left this image forever. So we see from this that it's 14 long and 3 foot as uh, 3 foot 7 inches wide. So we begin now, we're going to have, today we're going to be looking, yes, through the eyes of faith, but we're also going to be looking through the eyes of science. So we've already gone through a lot of science. So this is how the image was put on there, okay, through those 34,000 billion uh, watts of energy, but we now, through the science of those who have investigated this, we can look deeper and deeper into what this man suffered. So the first bits of information that we know is that the man that was in there, he was 5 foot 11 tall, and that he weighed 175 pounds, and he was between the ages of 30 and 35. The linen cloth that was there is of uh, extremely high quality. So, who, can, who took down the body of Christ? Who gave him? Does anybody know? Who gave him the tomb? Joseph of Arimathea. And what do we know from the scriptures about Joseph of Arimathea? We know that he was a rich man. So, Jesus had friends, yes. He, he, he went around those who were sinners and those who were very poor, but he also had very rich friends. And these rich friends, those are the ones that are commissioned, who were asked to look after Jesus when he has died. So Joseph gives him a tomb, but he also provides him with a living cloth, which again is of extremely high quality. To give you some indication, the, the living cloth that Cleopatra, if you studied her, uh, wasn't half as good. Uh, you know, for, as material-wise, as what the, this linen cloth was. So it's what's called herring bone. How's that look like? Zigzag formation of the linen. There's your start right there. So, what we know from the passion, what we know from the, the shroud, gives us indication as to what this man suffered. So, what does it tell us? 
It gives us a huge amount of information. So in the, in the Gospels, we, we, in particularly Luke, because Luke, we know, for, was a physician, so he was a doctor. So Luke gives us lots of information that the other Gospel writers do not give us. And Luke specifically gives a lot of the medical data. So when he's healing people, he gives us descriptions about their suffering, about the symptoms that were there, and then also what, what the person was like immediately afterwards. But also then when we get to the Garden of Gethsemane, so Jesus has celebrated the Last Supper, and then he goes with his apostles and disciples, and he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And Luke gives us a very clear description that he prayed, he prayed, was praying so hard that his sweat became like drops of blood. And this we know now from science, from medicine, is a very real medical condition. Anybody want to pronounce that word? Yeah. I think it's like hypnosis. Amatidosis, yes. So this is actually a medical condition when somebody, and it's a, it's a rare condition, but it happens, that if somebody is under extreme stress, okay, they're really, really stressed, that the capillaries under the, the, the level of the skin, they're under so much stress that they begin to burst. So these are very near our pores where the more sweat comes out of it. So all these capillaries, are, they burst, and then they, they find their immediate way because they, they need to leave the body, so they come out through the pores. So it very much looks like uh, somebody is feeling. And so we've, we've seen this, uh, this has been recorded uh, numerous times, uh, even here in the States. Uh, there's some, you know, someone who's under, very, uh, under a lot of stress. Uh, there was a woman in Ohio only a few years ago. Uh, she was saying goodbye to her family. Uh, her husband and her children were going, going out somewhere for the day. And as they were pulling off, a, a lorry hit the car. And they all died instantly. And she saw this. And this is what happened to her immediately. That she, she this stress hit her so quickly that they, all her capillaries uh, began to burst. And it was like as if she was bleeding. So we have a very now clear description of what is being described in script, scripture, but what is also now coming out in reality in the shroud. But accompanied with that metadosis is a great sensitivity. So when this blood is coming out, the skin becomes extremely, extremely sensitive. So you need anything to touch whatsoever is going to give great pain to somebody who's, who's suffering this. So this is why the kiss of Judas is something which is very powerful. Obviously, when Judas had given up, had offered Jesus up to the chief priests for 30 pieces of silver, and he said, and, and they asked for a sign of who, which one of the men would be Jesus? And he offered that the one he goes up and kisses. So when Judas goes up, he gives the kiss, the kiss of betrayal, which begins the real passion of Jesus. And not only is this what caused Jesus great suffering, because his friend, who he has been with and traveled with and cared for all these years, has now betrayed him. But also with that betrayal, becomes the real physical suffering. So Judas' embrace of Jesus this is the first violence that would have taken, that Jesus would have gone through. And so then we go through the passion. Jesus is arrested, he is brought before the chief priests. And there we see the, another bit of violence taking place because they're, they're going back and forth. And what does Jesus say when he is being questioned? Nothing. He remains completely silent. And then until the very end, where he complains that he is God, and this they get outraged because this is blasphemy. How can this man say that he is God? And one of the chief priests goes up and it says in the, in the scriptures that he strikes him on the cheek. And what we can see in the shroud is that we see uh, a brew, a swelling on the right side of the face, on the cheek. This indicates to us, and it matches up with scripture, because 
swelling is going to take place after a patient to about 24 hours afterwards. So this is uh, Thursday night, Friday morning, Thursday night, Jesus laid in the tomb Friday evening, so we have there 24 hours uh, have passed, and we see that because if someone were to hit, hit somebody, they're not going to develop a bruise or a swelling particularly straight away. That takes time to develop. So it matches up what's been discovered and what's been revealed through the science of the shroud, shows that this uh, bruise is there that also matches up what has been described for sure. The scourging at the pillar. This is a very unique form of torture which took place at the time of the Roman Empire. And they would have used this instrument, and at the end, there was two on each string, of the three strings over there, there was two dead balls. And these were used and on, on whoever it was that was on the criminal, who was to receive these scourgings. And we see, because scripture, in the Old Testament, it described that they were only allowed to hit or to use give a certain amount of lashes, okay, a certain number. But we see that Jesus gets double those. What we can discover from the shroud is that there are 122 of these marks right throughout the body from, from head to toe. These are the outlines of the, as we found, discovered from the shroud. Another interesting point is that when it comes to the crown of your horns, many of us, I'm sure, will be seeing that this is what the horns were like. That it was kind of like a round halo, you know, like what we would understand a crown to be. But this was not a crown at the time of Jesus. The time of Jesus, the kings that wore a crown, and also, we have to remember in the Old Testament, priests wore a crown. And it wasn't a crown like we have today. This is a modern interpretation of what a crown looks like. A crown in the time of Jesus was more like a helmet. So it goes right around, right over the head, and right down. So this, and we know from the shroud as well, the type of thorns that were used, because of the pollen that was taken from the shroud. So this represents a great suffering, because we know from the injuries of the shroud as well, <clears throat> the impact that it had, not only that it, that it pierced the skin, we can actually just see from the shroud that it actually pierced the bone skull. Because we can have different descriptions of the type of blood that was, that we, and we, this is only, we only discover this and we only know this because of the advancement of science. So we can describe, we can see that there's different blood patterns. So what science has, has brought forth to us is that there's a difference in the blood which comes from a vein and there's a difference in the blood that comes from an artery. So we can see the, the, the wounds that these thorns inflicted. So protruding, penetrating the veins, and also penetrating the arteries and penetrating uh, the skull bone. But you must think as well that Jesus carried a cross, it was like a T-shape. But this is not what the, the carrying of the cross would have been in the time of Jesus, in the crown that he, so the, the cross that he carried, it would have been more like this. Okay, so this is historically right, but we also know that it's right from the shroud. The shroud, you see that the, um, the injuries that are on the shoulders indicate to us that this is where the cross, the timber, bone um, was placed because, again, of how harsh we see uh, the injury on the shoulders, that it was actually, there was no skin, to the point that there was no skin, so it was really rubbing in and digging in to Jesus as he's carried his cross. He would have been tied up in a rope with a beam on his shoulder and that he would have uh, gone through the path, walking to the Calvary land. We also know as well, so because the hands were tied up, so that when he fell, and we had these injuries from on his nose, 
and on his knees. So when Jesus fell, because we, we know that he fell three times, that he fell right directly onto his knees and then straight down onto his face. Because his hands were tied up to the knee, he would not have been able to brace himself or to, to ease the fall. He would have fell right down. And we see that there is a breaking of the cartilage on the nose. This is what we find uh, on the shawl as well. That the nose isn't broken, but the cartilage is broken. Because we know uh, in, in the scripture that not one of his bones were broken. Another thing then from the science that we, we've, we've seen through the shroud, but also from the start of that, is the nailing of the, of the cross. So many of us would think that the nails went through the palm, but this isn't scientifically true. Uh, this wouldn't have been able to hold Jesus, Jesus up or a man uh, up on the cross. Uh, this science, this experiment was done in the 50s by a French doctor, and he wrote a book uh, called Doctor at Calvary. And that you can read that today. He did an experiment, and if a man was nailed to the hands and placed upon the cross, he would only be suspended there for about 10 seconds before he, he would rip uh, the, through, the, through the hand and fall. We know that the nail went through uh, the wrist, and we know exactly where it went. So if you actually, and you can discover this for yourself, in your, your baby finger and your thumb, put them together, and you turn it at a 90 degree angle, and you see this little bit that kind of sticks out, the cartilage, right next to that, so to the right of that little cartilage, the little bone that sticks out, you can kind of feel a little, little hole there. If you go around to the other side of your wrist then as well, you, you, you discover there's a kind of little uh, depth there, there's a kind of little hole. This is exactly where the nail would have gone through. And it goes through because we know that the Romans were experts at execution. So they wanted the person to suffer as much as possible. So the, the reason why they put through there particularly, yes, because the man would be able to be held up, but also because it goes through two specific nerves, the most painful nerves in the body. We have records of this even in World War II. That these were two particular nerves that if they were in any ways affected or if a cut went through into them and they were cut or severed, the soldiers would have preferred to kill themselves than wait for help to come. That's how excruciating uh, the pain was. Excruciating pain, that comes from the cross. That word, excruciating, excruciates from the cross, that's Latin, from the cross, excruciating. That's why, uh, that's where we get that word. So then, we come to the moment of the crucifixion then, so he has carried his cross, he has carried the beam, he is nailed to the cross, through the wrist, and there would be two holes either side of that beam, so they would have been, would have been used for multiple crucifixions, uh, so they knew exactly where uh, to put the nails, they weren't putting in fresh nails all the time, reuse nails into the same hole and if the arm didn't reach they would just simply put and dislocate the arm in order for it to get it in to the hole. So then he would have been lifted up and all his weight uh, would have been upon those nerves and upon those hands. We also see because before he was lifted up that cross would have been pressing upon the thorns against the the, the vertical beam. So this is where we see the, the, the intrusions, the, uh, the nails penetrating uh, the skull bone. Then he is lifted up upon the cross, and then the nails go away through the feet. So we see here directly, and we know this directly from the shroud, the feet that are there, protruding right there, just at the, the center of the foot there. This would be also, so when he was on the cross, it's extremely hard to breathe because of the, where, because of where the body is positioned, it's very hard to breathe. And the only way that you're going to be able to breathe is by lifting yourself up so that you can grasp some air. 
So you're down this way. You only really need to go up. So he needed to pull himself up. The only way that Jesus would have been able to pull himself up is by pressing upon the nails on his foot, on his feet, and pulling himself up by the nails in his hand. And so allowing uh, the lungs and the ribcage to take in some breath. We see here from the, the blood patterns and the directions of which the blood is flowing upon the, the, uh, on the hands, on the wrists, uh, from the man in the shroud, is that not only was he pulling himself up, we see that there is a different direction of the blood and showing indi that indicates to us scientifically that not only would he have to have pulled himself up, he would have had to twist himself in a way in which to get, to get breath. It's extraordinary to see. And this is all this pain. Remember those nerves that are there in, in the wrist, the most severe? Uh, so pressing upon those nerves, not only pulling himself up, because obviously he wasn't able to get a breath there, he had to have twisted himself. So we know this from the science of the shroud. Being on the cross and being in that position is extremely difficult. So not only is it difficult to breathe, it's virtually impossible then to speak because of the effort it would take for you to, to even breathe. But we see from uh, the scriptures that Jesus is speaking. He's, he's giving words, he's giving commandments uh, to his apostles. One well, of the most important is forgive them, Father, for they know not what they are doing. And we see from the, the Greek that is there, so it indicates to us that if he didn't just say it once, the verb indicates to us that he was repeating it. So he was constantly repeating uh, this phrase uh, from the Psalms. He forgives those who were crucifying him to the good tea. Thief, then he gives paradise. He said, Today you will be with me in paradise. He gives a very another important line. He tells John, he says, Take Mary into your home. Uh, so this is indicating to us for all his disciples forever. Because he doesn't use the word John, he uses the word disciple. So whenever Jesus uses that, he, he's speaking to all of us for all the generations to come about the importance of bringing Mary into our homes, into our souls, into our hearts. So we have this extraordinary act of love. And this is what Christ is doing. All these sufferings are there for us. So he is taking these upon himself. The crown of thorns was used in the Old Testament as a sign of sin. So we see this first coming out in the book of Genesis. So after Adam and Eve are leaving the garden, we have this pronunciation of a thorn. So they've always been represent, representation of sin, right throughout the Old Testament and even in the New. Even to the point where Jesus has put these thorns on his head. So again, showing us that he is the one who's going to bear the sins. He is the sin bearer. He takes those sins through the symbolism of thorn, obviously, but also uh, what uh, they have inflicted upon him. We also know from, from the scripture that he was pierced inside because they uh, wanted to make sure that he was dead. And we see this also then coming through in the shroud. So uh, that part where it's circled, so this is where the uh, incision would have been uh, of, the, of the sword. And we know exactly the measurements and the shroud from, from that as well, what those were, I think they were three inches by one. Um, and so, the, and the, what's coming down then, that, that is the blood. So this is, the, that was the suffering that our Lord went through. And this is the sort of agony, and it's really, this is the time, or this is the week, where we contemplate that. It's, different from all the other times of the year, where we focus on different things, the teachings of Jesus, what he came to do, about loving God, following his commandments. But in this week, 
Passion Tide this week and then next week Holy Week. This is where we're going to think a little bit deeper of what actually happened at the Passion. And we know, not only from Scripture, but we know from the Shroud of Turin and what took place at that. So the science is extraordinary what comes through here of what this man suffered. And it's only through science that we actually know what happened here. We know from the wounds, we know from the head, we know from the blood spatters, we know from the bruising, we know from the, the lashes. We know for because of science, we know that there was two men who were striking Jesus at the scourging. We know from the directions of those, those lashes, we know that one man was taller than the other one. So we can actually, science can tell us the actual height of the men because of the angle of the way the, uh, the blows came uh, upon Jesus. And what's amazing is that this is what Jesus does for us. This is the suffering that he goes through um, for us. And he didn't have to. And not only did he didn't even need to experience the, the passion, but also he could have taken away any sense of pain just by thinking of it. That's because he's God, so he could. But he endures that suffering, that pain uh, for us. Then we have that glorious moment of the resurrection on Sunday. And this is and then this is the end. Of the story. It doesn't end with the passion. That is only the beginning of the newness of life, which takes place on Sunday with the resurrection, with that first sudden burst of light, which took place that morning in that tomb and left that image on the shroud for us to see. In the resurrection, Jesus then goes to his disciples. He goes and he's seen by many. And one, when he first appears, who is missing? Who is not there when he goes into the house and the apostles go into the upper room? <coughs> Thomas. Yeah, he's away. And Thomas, who's got the title, the Doubting Thomas, he says, I don't believe it. Until I see him and I can put my fingers into those wounds, then I know that it is true. So therefore, Jesus then appears to them again. Thankfully, Thomas is there. And Jesus knew what was in Thomas' mind. And he calls him forward. He says, now, put your fingers into my side. If you see these wounds, which I endured at the crucifixion. This is an indication for us today. Because many of us might doubt that Jesus uh, existed, that he was God. Um, and then we look for signs. And like Thomas, we want to be able to see, we want to be able to analyze and actually penetrate and see what took place here. And this, I believe, is why God has left us the shroud. That God imprinted himself at the moment of the resurrection. It's for all of us who doubt to use science to understand what has taken place here. And to understand the truth of this drought. Because for 19 centuries, 1,900 years, we just saw this without as it was, just believing that it was the shroud. It wasn't until science and technology began to grow and become better and better that we actually were able to see really what took, what took place or what really is this image on the shroud. And we're still we're probably going to discover more things the more science and technology uh, evolves and becomes better. Scientists then, with artists, produce a 3D image of what the body was like when the image was imprinted on the shroud. So here we see, uh, through, through art, and through science, what the body was like when it was placed in the shroud. So we can see the wounds that are there, the wounds in the wrist, the wound in the side, tied as he was tied up.
dragged. We see the wounds from the head to toe, front and back, of the scurry that took place. We see the blood which comes from the crown of thorns. We see the, nose, the injury on the nose. We see the injury on the eye, on the cheek, where he was struck. Here's a close up image. So this is exactly what would have been the image that was imprinted on the shroud. <coughs> and with that then, <coughs> science began restoring and to see with the, with the miracle of uh, science and also with art that we can remove those wounds so that we can see what did Jesus look like as he walked around and engaged with people, children, adults, sick people, lepers. And we're left with this image. So this is the image of what Jesus would have looked like as he walked around and just before uh, the Passion took place. I think this is a beautiful image uh, for us to kind of contemplate. Yes, the wounds, but also the person, the face. The face of love, the face of mercy. And this is the face that we put our faith and our trust in. This is God whom we love. So in these days, let us take this image as it was, he who was before us. This is the image that is present at every Mass, every time we receive Holy Communion. This is the body that we are receiving. This is God Himself. So we finish with a little prayer. And I might take some questions, then we might do the rosary, if that's okay. Yeah? O King of Kings, whose limbs were stretched on the cross, O Lord, who did suffer the bruises, the wounds, the loss, we stretch ourselves beneath the shield of thy might, some fruit of the tree of thy passion, fall on us this night. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, so.